So first of all, thank you for coming. My name is Brian Ruth. I'm a senior software engineer at Garmin. And my talk today is going to be about infiltrating a code base or moving towards a better C. So first, some motivation about this talk. So why are we having a C talk at a C++ conference? So I don't know if you remember, but a few years back, Dan Sachs gave a talk um, talking about how to talk to C developers about C++. And the theme throughout the entire talk is, if you are arguing, you're losing. And the talk wasn't so much about code or coding practices or things like that. It was more about the psychology, trying to understand the people that you're trying to convince and put yourself in their shoes. So this got me thinking about my own like C++ evangelism. Like, why didn't I always succeed when I was doing it? And maybe I needed to understand better the people who I was trying to convince, you know, play by the rules of their game before I try and influence them with mine. So first of all, like it or not, C slash C++ is still a thing. People still think that they're one in the same language, but as developers of each language, they are significantly different. Just because the syntax is similar doesn't mean that the way that they go about doing things, the idioms, the paradigms, the way the code is flowing, all of that is completely different between the two, and it takes two different mentalities to understand these things. So you need to understand the historical constraints of C. When you're faced with some you know, code that has things that look odd to you, you need to understand where it comes from, why they went that way, what constraints the original authors were under when they wrote this code. You also want to use code that's familiar to C developers. If you start throwing in a bunch of classes and lambdas and algorithms and things like that that they don't, they've never seen before, it's just going to alienate them and, and make them push back even harder. But you also want to make sure you address fundamental concerns. So take a look at this code base. See what the problems are. See where the bugs are. See what issues that they've fought with. And then try and address your message to, to those particular things, because those are already pain points that they're aware of. And you always don't get to start from scratch. One of the things that coders love to do is to come in, look at some code that they don't understand, and say, you know what, I'm just going to write it from scratch. Well, existing code has value. It's battle tested. It's been there for a while. It's making the company money. And by throwing it away, you're throwing away all of that useful information that's been built up over years and years and years of that code being used. So that kind of ends up with code that uh, people are like, don't touch this. Don't touch this at all. It works. If you need to make changes, just make a copy of it. So you see that a lot as well. Um, and tests, if they exist at all, they're probably not there on that set of code, which is why no one touches it. And you may get lucky and have some .cpp files within your project, but upon further inspection, you'll notice that it's literally just C with a different extension. And another reason is old projects still need to be supported. So maybe there's some bug fixes or regulation changes or something, and you need to use some old project with an old compiler. And you need to understand the C code because you're under those constraints to make that maintenance release. So understanding where C came from is another benefit. So why not C++? So this is kind of an informal poll of C programmers that I've talked to. So you hear things like it's object-oriented, macros and templates are just the same for debugging. It's bloated. Uh, C++ hides what it's doing from you. My team knows C. They don't know C++. And these are all legitimate concerns coming from C developers. So if you start arguing back against any of these things, you've already lost. So there's, you know, you're not going to win. You're not going to get them to, to move forward. So you need to know your users. You need to know not only the people using your code outside the company, but also you need to understand the code or the people using your code within the company. So you can't take a C code base and immediately switch it over to C++, especially modern C++. So first of all, the tools may not support it. I had something a few weeks back where I spent a weekend backporting some code to C99 because one of the projects that used that code had to use a compiler that didn't support anything past C98. So you need to, before you go down this path of making all these wholesale changes, you need to understand who's using that code. Um, and traditionally, too, compilers for C++, I work on embedded devices, have been very, very poor at C++. Most of the embedded, uh, embedded compiler makers uh, have focused on C because that's what all of their, their customers use. Only recently has C++ started getting more and more support for, uh, for compilers, but that's you know, another historical reason that people have been leery of using C++. Um, C++ may also introduce problems, memory performance or other things like that. So if you take a look and you see some code that looks really odd, well, there might be a reason for that. That might be some workaround for some firmware on some chip that we have no control over. 
So if you go and change it and make it better, you may actually be breaking everything. So understand what's going on. But a common, common ground for both, for everybody involved is we want to make safer and more maintainable code the default. So what steps as C++ developers can we take to start moving, this code, moving C developers forward, making this code better? Well, we want to make it easy to read. Legacy code is fraught with a lot of issues of readable. So we want to minimize macros, utilize constant scoping, isolate globals. We want to reduce duplication. Reducing function size is one good way to do that. We don't want to introduce regressions. One surefire way to stop things is if the code that you enter is worse performing than the code you're replacing. So you need to make sure that the new code is as good, if not more um, efficient than the code you're replacing. And you want to speak the same language. You want to use the C compatible, or at least the C familiar set of C++, so that everybody on all the teams can keep moving forward as you're improving this code. All right, so minimizing macro use. This is going to kind of get them used to uh, the C++ type system and trying to start using the compiler to kind of help them out. So macros are, are necessary sometimes. Um, in C, there is no generics. So having something like this, which just gives you a max val of two numeric values, um, is necessary. It's not type check, but it's how you have to do it. And another one, and this is actually currently true in, in C++ until you get generators in 23 or 26, um, is going to be to stamp out boilerplate. This is pretty much the only way to do that right now. Um, another one is uh, for conditional compilation. I know there was a talk earlier today about getting rid of this, but it's still ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So if you wanted to have you know, debug print statements that are removed during release, this is one way to go about doing it. And another one is inheritance. So C has no concept of inheritance. So if you wanted to have a, a function that takes in you know, this packet processing and then either processes large or small packets based on you know, the type, this is how you're going to have to do it if you want to cast between the two, you know, assuming that the uh, packing is the same for both of those. But this is also true for C++, at least for now, if you have some type of external generator that creates a bunch of getters and setters that are then later on put into your class this is one of the, the better ways to go about doing it. Um, compile time constants. So C does not allow constant L values to be used at compile time. So all of these instances in C++ at least are completely valid code. But in C it fails to compile. Can't use it as a size and array. Can't use it as a case in a switch statement. You can't even use it to calculate another constant integer. So you see these types of things in C. Using macros as a constant preprocessor comes in, just replaces it. Fine. And this, as a C++ developer going and looking at C code, uh, it was really weird to see large unnamed enums with a whole bunch of completely unrelated values that just have data assigned to them. Uh, well, the reason behind it is enums are actually constant expressions. They can be used at compile time. And they're also going to be int compatible. So that means that they're at least an int, but depending on the compiler, they may make it smaller if, if they can. But not all constants are needed at compile time. So sometimes you can use runtime constants. So up here on the left-hand side, I've got a, a display using a macro. On the right-hand side, I've got the display using a constant integer. And as it turns out, the code generated between the two is exactly the same. The compiler's smart enough to know that this constant can just be replaced. Another time that macros are used a lot is in what I'm calling pseudo functions. So where a section of code is instead of just inlined and copy and pasted, it's broken out into a separate callable thing. So a nice thing about this, at least from the embedded side, is that it forces the compiler to inline um, the code everywhere it's, quote, called. But the downside, though, is that it can lead to code bloat, because this is just copy and pasted all over, and you're kind of short-circuiting with the, compiler, uh, the compiler's ability to smartly inline things. There's also no type checking, so your errors or warnings might be really weird. Um, debuggers tend to have a really hard time stepping through. And it's also prone to a lot of maintenance issues. You know, correct braces, correct parentheses, semicolons. So sometimes you'll even actually see a you know, do while zero around there to hopefully make it easier to maintain or use. Uh, another thing is that all the multi-line code, you need to make sure it ends not only in a semicolon, but also in a backslash. And if you forget this, I've seen this forgotten in code, and it actually compiles. And it was really weird and really difficult to try and figure out what was going on. Um, you also can't have preprocessor checks. So if I wanted to have debug statements, those can't go in there. And as we'll see in the next slide, local variables can actually be hidden within that macro. So make real functions. Allow the compiler to decide whether or not it's inlined or not. 
Uh, Jason Turner did a uh, C++ Weekly a while back showing how Clang determines whether or not to inline things and how we can mess with that. Um, the arguments are going to be type checked, so you'll actually get real you know, compiler warnings, errors, and things like that. The code is going to read as normal source. You don't need to think about the context necessarily of where this macro is invoked. It's a real function with a real call, real arguments. You can put preprocessor macros in there. And this also exposed a hidden dependency. So the macro assumed that there was a text coordinate and a string color of type x, y type, and colors type that were declared prior to invoking that macro. Well, now it's explicitly part of the, the function call. You'll get errors, you'll get warnings, and you can call them locally whatever you want, variable names that make sense. And it turns out compilers like to inline. On the left-hand side is the macro version. On the right-hand side is the broken out function version. Zooming in on that eye chart, turns out that both of those are inlined. So utilizing const and scoping. So this is trying to get the C++ concepts of RAII, const expert, and again, the type system. So C++ developers, uh, scoping is something that you're kind of drilled into first day. Always declare things where they're used. Well, historically speaking, C didn't support that. So C8990, which is the ANSI C standard, all variables had to be declared at the top of the scope. So declarations and executable statements also couldn't be intermixed. So something like this, int i equals zero, fine, j, fine, assign j, executable statement, r fails to compile. Inside some condition, new scope, you're okay. So one of the reasons in a lot of C code you see int ijk sitting up at the top of the function is because for does not introduce a new scope. So you couldn't declare k there. It won't compile. But once you get into the loop, new scope, you're fine. Incidentally, C99, or the ISO C standard, will move this requirement. So if you can use a compiler that's 20 years out of date, you, uh, you should be OK to, to use this. Um, but because of that initial syntax, where declaring everything at the top, um, this led to a lot of variable reuse. So instead of having you know, multiple declarations of all the different names of a temp integer throughout the function and declaring a bunch of different stack variables, you see this generic temp paradigm used. So imagine this is a really long function. At the top, temp int ends up becoming the width and used to lay out a page. And then later on in the function, it's orbital velocity. It really makes understanding what this code does and maintaining the code very difficult. Turns out compilers are used to this. So on the left-hand side is the temp int. On the right-hand side, I've got constant named variables for each of those um, temporary integers. And it turns out the compiler can just see right through it, notice that the integer isn't reused afterwards, and generate the exact same code. This is even true for structs. Um, I've seen and have done in the past. In a for loop, if, if I have to keep filling a struct with some data, I would always declare it beforehand and not inside, because I don't want the, the for loop to reallocate every single time through. Well, this is something that compilers are used to as well. Put it inside the for loop, same code. Quick aside, macro scoping. I have noticed in code, macros defined within functions. Macros do not have scope. So something like this reads from the top down of the file. First is defined my val 7, OK. Further down, my val is used, OK. It's redefined down there. This may generates, generate a warning if you have warnings turned on, or if it does generate a warning, if you can notice it with all the thousands of other warnings that you're seeing. So this particular one, when you get into main, it's going to print out 7, because that's where it is at that point. It's going to call up to blorp, which is going to have 7 again, go down to the other function, print out 9, and then go back to main, where the value has been replaced with 7. Under maintenance, let's say this code gets rearranged, it completely changes what this code does because it just reads down from the top down. So const in C. So C89 didn't have const, and C90 added const and volatile. Const in C does not mean constant expression. It means read only. And that's only by software, C const volatile for hardware man manipulation. Um, but use C for the same reasons that you, or const in C for the same reasons you use in C++. So code contracts, if someone sees a const there, it tells them something about the code that they're calling, the code that they're using. Readability, so when you're going through trying to figure out what a function does, if you see something assigned to a const, well, you don't have to worry about that ever changing again. Compiler hints, so by making something const, you're telling the compiler, hey, this isn't gonna change, go ahead and optimize it. 
and to ensure assumptions. When you're maintaining legacy code or trying to refactor legacy code, if you assume something's not going to change, make it const. If it fails to compile, your assumptions need to be reevaluated. So const all the things. Make all function arguments const. So many times, especially in longer functions, the argument variables are actually reassigned and reused throughout the course of the function. And that makes it really difficult to determine where bugs are, what things are going on, if the value keeps changing. Um, Claim tidy warns on this, especially if you have it in the declaration. But I actually believe it conveys a lot of useful information that you know, even though the compiler doesn't care that you called it const, the person calling the function might want to know. Um, Another time that this is, is kind of useful is um, re for complicated expressions, especially conditionals. So when you first start out with some code, you've got an if and then a simple case, simple you know, condition in there. But over time, you, know, you start getting edge cases, bugs, things like that, and it becomes a really complicated expression. Well, if you can break those out into named constant booleans and then put those in the if statement, it gives the reader and the maintainer a better idea of what's going on, and they can more readily reason about how your code works. And most of the time, the compiler's just going to put all those in line anyways. It's not going to really cost you anything. Um, the other thing is, making something const enables some very powerful optimizations. Jason had a keynote a, a few years back where he was messing with the Commodore 64, and by making one of the variables const, um, like, it literally made almost all the program go away. Well, that's rare, just for the record. <laughs> um, but yeah, as an aside, casting away const. Don't ever cast away const. So just like in C++, the compiler is free to ignore you or not. One of the things you see in legacy code is, because it's not necessarily keeping const in mind, it's just functions that take things by pointers, whether it's for efficiency or something else. And they, whether they change it or not, they don't put the const on there. So when you're writing new code and you're making things const correct to make the compiler shut up, you simply just cast away const, pass it into the function, and everything works, maybe. So here, I've got a new function that wraps an old one. The value that I pass in, I cast away the const, pass it in there, it actually modifies the value. But then I've got a local constant that I cast away the const, pass it in, and it's ignored. So just don't cast away const. Reducing function size. So this is kind of getting into algorithms and classes and those types of things. A thousand line function. Why do those exist? How do they come to be? So. State machine, message-driven systems. This happens a lot as you add new states, new messages you want to handle. Those are literally just pasted into a switch statement. And you know, because they don't want to refactor the old code or don't want to pull out functions, you just get more and more of those things put in there. Convenience. You know, sometimes you have to make a change, and there's this one location where all the variables and functions and everything align. And you know, this is where I'm going to put it, even if the name of the function or whatever doesn't make sense. Hooks. If I'm trying to put some new code into, you know, splice it into some older code, you know, maybe there's a, a convenient location, again, convenience to go in and, and hook these two things up, even if it, you know, again, makes it a little difficult to read. And adapters. So if you're adapting some new code to old code, maybe you just throw that stuff in inline in a function to kind of make it do the manipulation right in place. So long functions, they generally do a lot of things. Not all of them are going to be related. So it makes reading the code, maintaining the code really difficult. They tend to have generic names like message processor, which really gives the person who's reading the code or calling the code no idea of what the preconditions, postconditions, or even what that function will do to their pro program. I uh, usually see a lot of unnecessary control flow, duplicated code. You get that copy, paste, modified. So like this code works, don't touch it. All right, well, I'm going to copy it over here, make my one change, move on. And again, variables changing meaning throughout the function. So we want to find some refactoring seams, things that are easy candidates to just pull out and make functions. So switch statements nested in other side con inside other control statements, or for that fact, any other type of like nested control is a pretty good way of, of going about pulling things out for functions. Uh, long if-else, if-else chains, if you can, try and make these into a switch statement. So at the very worst, it'll decay into if else, if else chains. But if the compiler can find some fancy ways to make things more efficient, it will. I've actually had issue, you know, instances where I take something that's more of like a runtime case, like trying to figure out like which button was clicked in a UI, converted all that runtime stuff to figure out which button was clicked, made that an enum, it pulled it back out, did a switch statement on it, generated a, it was a whole bunch more code, 
But when it compiled, it actually ended up being more efficient because the compiler was able to make some assumptions. Uh, this is my favorite one. Comments indicating what they do, not why they do it. So if you have a section of code that has a comment that says display string and pop page, and then followed by eight lines of code, take those eight lines of code and put them into a function that says display string and pop page. Turns out to work very well. Um, another thing that a lot of newer IDEs, newer editors allow you to do is actually just take a look at the shape of the code. This is Visual Studio, and it's got like the classic arrow code. You see it kind of going towards the edge and then coming back in. And that's going to indicate a lot of nested statements. So, or just sections of code that have similar looks. So some more subtle seams, okay? So on the left-hand side is a get employees from department, where you pass in a list, give it a department, and it gives you a filtered list. On the right-hand side is employees with greater than some number of years. The only difference between these two functions are those two comparisons. How do we add things to the function? Function pointers in C have existed forever. And one of the things, though, is that I don't see them used in the way that C++ programmers use algorithms. So something like this, you can actually have like a filter list function that's going to take a predicate and it's going to be whether it's an engineer or whether it's a uh, four-week vacation. And as you have more things, you can just keep passing that to this function. And if you needed to pass more parameters, you can just you know, extend, put some void stars or whatever at the end of your filter list. But if you can't refactor it right now, rename. So if you spend all this time looking at this function and it takes you forever to understand, OK, it does some setup, it checks to see if it exists, it updates a record, it adds a new record. If you don't have the time to go through and rearrange all this, capture your knowledge by renaming it, whether it's a variable, whether it's the function name, if, you're, if you can do it, if not too many things depend on it. So if this was called update or add request to database, it's going to at least tell somebody who's calling it what the function's going to do when you call it. So hopefully, you know, next time you come by, you'll understand it, save yourself a bunch of time. And if somebody gets really annoyed by the name, maybe they'll go and refactor it for you. And the last thing is isolating globals. So this is getting towards C++ classes. So C is a global language. It is used constantly throughout the coding paradigms of C. Uh, one of the more insidious ones are extern functions and variables and implicit functions, where you basically just rely on the linker to fix everything for you. Uh, but macros and global variables exist as well. So a quick exercise. So this code snippet here relies on a global current canvas. So it's X turned out, and there's a column count, and it makes it sets a dirty flag. And when you draw, it's dirty, recalculates the width, and then clears the dirty flag. So one of the first things we can do is pull that, func that variable out into a function that returns a constant pointer. And what that's going to do is it's going to identify the locations we're modifying that variable, or that global. So it's not going to compile. Next thing you can do is make a mutable version of that function, and then put that in all the locations where it's modified. And then take a look at all the places where it's modified and see if there's any similarities. Can this be made into a separate function? For this particular example, it's just setting and clearing the, the dirty flag. So let's make a separate function for that. And as it turns out, I chart again, left-hand side is going to be the global version. Right-hand side is going to be the all the functions broken out into the same file version. It ends up generating the exact same code. So ideally, we would like to get here. We would like to get to having things separated out into separate classes and separate files. One of the problems with that, though, is at least for this particular thing, it really depends on how it's implemented. Because the way it's implemented here does actually generate a few extra function call overhead, or a little extra function call overhead. So you don't want to put that in, because one of the rules is you don't want to introduce any extra overhead. So the takeaway from this, and wow, this finished a lot quicker than I thought. <laughs> the takeaway from this is if you're arguing, you're losing. So just make sure that you're putting yourself in the shoes of the people that you're talking to. Some resources here. Um, trust in your compiler, Matt Godbolt, what everyone should know about how amazing compilers are. Some really cool things about just how the compiler can see through your code and make really weird math that does magic. Um, Jason's talk on uh, the Commodore 64 where he built Pong on stage and played it with Herb. Um, the, the reason I started doing this talk is Dan Sachs' extern C, talking to C programmers about C++. 
uh, JSON C++ weekly on inlining. And then that whole section on naming, I had first heard that on the Legacy Code Rocks podcast, uh, but it turns out the guest, Arlo Belshi, actually has an entire um, blog series on how to go about renaming and refactoring names in Legacy Code. And you know, if we want to understand the history of C, uh, we should probably understand the history of C++ and how C influenced C++ and what changes were made and the reasons why, so that we can, again, discuss with C developers what's going on. And then two great books for um, working with legacy code uh, by Feathers, and one is uh, Refactoring, the second edition. Uh, it's a little bit more updated for modern, modern programming. So, wow, I actually have four minutes left for questions if anybody wants to ask. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned, I think, the very harmful feature in C, but I think you didn't pay uh, sufficient attention for it. It's uh, implicit function declaration. I think I should tell, I must tell to everyone that th this is only warning in C. It's not an error. And this warning must be switched into an error uh, by compiler flux. Right. Yeah, it's not necessarily an error. It's a warning. And cling tidy actually like flags it all the time. Um, but in my opinion, it shouldn't. <laughs> uh, would you recommend to create uh, in C uh, something similar to C++ member functions, like special set of functions working with specific structure? Yeah, yeah. So I had a whole other section. This was originally proposed as a one-hour talk. I had a whole other section about dealing with like pseudo classes and polymorphism and stuff like that, trying to use the structures and, and function pointers to do that type of thing. All right, cool. Thank you.